Hello everyone, this is John Buck, back for another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. Uh, in this video we're going to finish the sampling story off by talking about reconstruction. So if you haven't already watched the earlier videos talking about uh, the basic ideas of sampling and deriving the sampling theorem, uh, you need to pause this video and go watch those first or this one won't make any sense because uh, it's meant to be the last in the series. But the problem we're going to talk about is if I have uh, a bunch of discrete samples of a signal, how do I reconstruct or interpolate that signal to get back the original signal and how well can I do that? Uh, so let me uh, pause the video here and get to the whiteboard. So again, the topic of this video is reconstruction, or it's sometimes also called interpolation in some places, so I want to make sure you're familiar with both names. But the, in, in pictorial form, the, the problem is this. If I have these uh, discrete samples, shown here as xp of t, so these impulses where the heights are all, or the areas have all been scaled based on the height of the original signal, I want to figure out what can I do to get back my original signal. How well can I reconstruct it? And so maybe this, uh, we would call this x sub r the reconstruction of t. And so how do we make, can we do this so that it's equal to the original xc of t, assuming that we sampled without aliasing? So again, our goal is to reconstruct the original xc of t from that pulse train xp of t. So again, we saw the key to thinking about this is in the frequency domain. If I have my sort of a nominal little triangle spectrum, but again, the shape is not important. What is important is that this is finite width and frequency, that it is band limited in frequency. And now I've sampled it and I have these copies repeating, right, and in both directions on the omega axis forever, where this omega over s is our radian sampling frequency, 2 pi over t. And so conceptually, just we say, well, if I wanted to get back to the original signal I showed you in the earlier videos, what I really want to do is take a pair of scissors, right, and just sort of cut this out and keep it. We say, well, there's a, you know, there's a mathematical name for, for cutting this out, multiplying by, by a constant in this frequency range, and this would be uh, between halfway in between, so minus pi over t and pi over t, I'm going to pass it through. And so I could call this, in fact, my reconstruction filter, h sub r for reconstruction. And then to fix the gain, again, this isn't that important, but let's take a moment to mention, if this had a gain of t, the 1 over t in height and the t would cancel out. But the most important thing, again, is this width and frequency. So it says I want to do this low-pass filter with a cutoff of omega s over 2 will get rid of all the copies but keep the original signal and as long as as I don't have any overlap in the copies that is as long as I originally satisfied the sampling theorem I should be fine here I should get back the original signal so that's sort of a good graphical representation of what's going on right in equations we're saying well I want to create a reconstructed signal xr of j omega is going to be the result of applying this reconstruction filter in frequency, multiplying it with xp of j omega, right? So it's like saying, I, if I want to think of this as in block diagram form, I'm taking that pulsed signal and putting it through an LTI system that is the reconstruction filter shown as the red line above. And then what I get out will be xr of j omega. And so when I do that, well, uh, what, what will happen when I multiply the original white signal with the, the red one here, I'll just end up with the center version, right? I'll end up with the original version of the signal centered at zero, height of one, because the one over t cancels the t, and then this upper edge will be at omega m and minus omega m. And so we can see in this picture, it does equal the original spectrum I started with. And again, it's, whatever shape it is, it will be fine as long as it's band limited and I satisfied the Nyquist theorem, right? Or the, the sampling theorem, which says that, so, so if 
we have uh, our sampling theorem is greater than two times the highest frequency in the signal. So our sampling frequency was at least twice the highest frequency in the signal. The reconstructed Fourier transform will equal the original Fourier transform, which is to say if they match at every frequency, the two signals match and it sounds or looks exactly like it should. Uh, so this is this is a, uh, a good thing. If we think about what this means in time, well again, good to, to, to pause for a the video for a minute and remember, if I'm multiplying two thi things in frequency, what's happening in time? Pause for a moment. Okay, well now we're back. For multiplying in frequency, we're convolving in time. So this says if I think in the time domain, what's going on is I have this impulse response of the red filter up above convolving itself with these pulses. Well, it's not too different from what we've seen in discrete time. If I have something that's a rectangle in, in uh, frequency, this will again be a sync function where this will be at uh, pi over t, a big T times capital T over pi t. So this will be a sync function that cuts off uh, every t. And so by convolving it with the original pulse train, it's kind of an interesting idea. Where, oh, that's on the previous page, actually. We're, we're essentially interpolating between these samples by putting a, copying a sync on top of each of them and adding them up. That detail isn't as important. The main thing that is to understand, it, it's sort of helpful for, to see that for some people, but the most important thing to understand is that to reconstruct the signal, we're doing this low-pass filter, and it's easier to think about what that's doing in frequency, which says it's taking this signal that has copies that we've been very careful not to overlap and, and just pull out the original one. Which raises one last question we should talk about is what hap what happens when we don't satisfy the Nyquist or the sampling theorem? So what happens when we do not satisfy the sampling theorem? Right, which is more precisely it says when omega s is less than two times the highest frequency in the signal. Well, again, thinking of the picture, we'd have copies every omega s, but what that means is that omega s is not large enough, and these copies start overlapping. And so when we go now to filter it out, if, if this was our omega s or minus omega s, because these things overlap, when we go filter it at pi over t, which is omega s over 2, right, when we cut this out, I haven't drawn this very well, but what would happen is some of these higher frequencies have sort of wrapped back or folded back inside, and this is what we call aliasing. Right, and we call them aliasing because it's like acting like somebody else, right? We say, like in a mystery movie, we, someone has an alias means it's a false name, that they're pretending to be somebody else. And that's what's going on here, is that these high frequencies are pretending to be lower frequencies because they've been mathematically, we say, aliased into the pass band. So aliasing is what happens when we violate the sampling theorem and higher frequencies reappear in the reconstructed signal as if they were lower frequencies. So this stuff that should have been up here, one of the other copies ends up over here instead. Okay, so that's enough for this time. I'm going to stop here, uh, give you a basic tour between these videos of the process of uh, modeling sampling, finding the sampling theorem, looking at an example, another example of what's going on and, and working it all out in terms of frequencies, and then finally showing you how we can reconstruct signals or the, the pieces of the story. All right, that's all for now. I'll see you in the next video.